Chainsaw. <laughs> yep. There you go, Nate. <laughs> All right, we did have a saw discussion. Perfect. So looking at the schedule, we have a new video scheduled for Thursday night. How to do laundry by Nate. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who haven't heard, there's a little <laughs> discussion you, you're right, right, yeah. <laughs> about various approaches in doing laundry, apparently. Uh, oh, I don't. just, I blame it on Adam and Eve. <laughs> without, without that, we would have no clothes <laughs> at all. We have to do laundry. <laughs> all right, moving on. <laughs> Oh, to, okay, we're on. Um, we didn't, I didn't think we needed to record that part. <laughs> uh, we're going to look at John chapter 10 today, and the first 10 verses. And a few questions related to that. And I think I will let you want to open in prayer, Nate? Yeah, uh, I would love to. Lord, we just thank you so much for uh, this time to study your word and uh, to just glean, glean from your words. And we just thank you so much that you died for us, that uh, we have salvation through your son. And uh, without that, we would be lost and we just pray to you in your son's name. Amen. And Joe, I didn't give you any advance warning, but you want to, could you read the first 10 yeah. verses? First 10 verses, yes. Yep. John chapter 10, 1 through 10. Yep. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hears his vo hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So five questions that we're running through. I'll just go, go through them quickly, and then we'll take them each individually after that. What does Jesus mean by having life more abundantly? What does the promise of abundant life not include? How do we cultivate an abundant life? What roles do trials and pain and suffering play in an abundant life? And how does living an abundant life enable us to be a witness to others in the church and outside of the church? So <clears throat> those are the five questions that we will run through. And I'm just going to rotate here. I'm going to kind of stay in the background when I can. But uh, Joe, you want to take number one? What does Jesus mean by having life more abundantly? All right. So uh, on verse 10 is what I was looking at. That was where it's from, uh, 10, 10. Looking at the beginning of the verse where it mentions the thief, uh, there was a difference between a robber and a thief. I had listened to a message that kind of pointed that out. I thought it was a good point. A robber took things for himself to keep and a thief took to destroy. So in this case, the thief is one who takes away the life of the sheep, not just taking the sheep away, but, but kills them. So with the shepherd there present, he is providing protection from the thief, which is death and Satan, which leads to death. So the good shepherd being there present with the sheep, he is providing life. Since he is always there with us, his sheep, we always have life, which is why he says abundantly. Uh, this is the assurance of our protection, our salvation, because once we become saved, he is always there with us, being our shepherd, protecting us from thieves or Satan. Uh, and then I thought a couple of parables that were a good example of that. Uh, if, 
I'll just reference to them. There's quite a bit of them. The one uh, who has more will be given, implied by the parable of the lamp under the jar, which are in Luke 8, 18, and uh, Mark 4, 24 to 25, and the parables of the talents, um, uh, which are in a couple of the Gospels, and the purpose of parables, Matthew 13, 12. These scriptures all show what I believe is implied in abundant life, because we already have something from God, his free gift, um, assurance of it while on earth by him being with us spiritually now but then as what is mentioned in the references in those parables uh, they will have more given to them which is life eternal in heaven which is what makes it more abundantly because they get protection from the shepherd not just then but always <clears throat> because he is always with them uh, romans according to romans 5 17 Christ's death, I'm going to read that. It's 517. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So according to that verse, Christ's death leads to abundance of grace and free gift of righteousness. Righteousness reign in life. Read my own. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so he's present with us, never leaves us. Okay. Nate, anything to add about saws? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. <laughs> uh, I had being saved by the shepherd now allows us to live with freedom, and uh, our sin is no longer separated us from God. I was in Romans a lot with mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff too. Um, Romans 6 10 for the death that he died. He died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, can you consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus? So that life abundantly, it's in, it's in Jesus that we have that abundant life. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, he did he did all of it he he's a shepherd and i have more on that too later but uh, okay uh, there's that what else do i have the six six twenty two now having been freed from sin and slave to god you derive derive your benefit result in sanctification and the outcome eternal life for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, eternally. Uh, we have that to, to look forward to, that uh, it's not continually being saved uh, or continually, you know, slaughtering bulls to take away our sin and we're being, he is the good shepherd, so. Okay. Thank you. And I looked at the word contentment. Um, looking at the Greek definition of abundant, um, meaning more than enough or an abundance in excess, complete. And Paul talked a lot about contentment. That's one word that maybe is a takeaway word for the day, being content. You're probably familiar with Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I speak from want, if I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So as Nate said, in Christ. So an abundant life is not necessarily living to an old age. It's not necessarily having lots of things. It's not being necessarily free of trials as we're told in James, to, that trials have a purifying effect. It's a life content in Christ. Familiar verses, but as we think about abundance, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And it goes on from there. <clears throat>
another verse that struck me as far as being related to being abundant life is towards the end of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, and there's the word abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. So abundance, contentment, I think the two are interlocked because the shepherd is present. So the second question, we'll let Nate take first crack at that one. Um, what does the abundant life not include as far as, well, no, <clears throat> no comment. Yeah, I, like God, that, like God wants us, that only, he only wants us to be happy and uh, that we are guaranteed to be rich on, on this earth. And uh, now that we have grace, we, we can do whatever we want. Uh, because just reading that question, I immediately went to Romans 6, where, what shall we say then? Are we to, get, to continue in sin so that grace may increase? And may it never be. Uh, just that thought that yeah, you, <clears throat> uh, you can just live life where you're guaranteed all these things. But that's not... That's not quite what it's what he's promising there. He's abundant life in, in Christ. If you're not, you know, if you're not living your life in Christ, then what what does it matter? Uh, he he's the one that has saved you. He's done everything. We've done absolutely nothing for our salvation. So and now we are to you know, turn to, you know, turn away from that one that saves us and just go on living our life and expect what? Uh, that's kind of my thought process on sure. that. Sure. Joe, anything to add? Uh, eight and a half. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'll just read it again. No, sure. And anyway, with more of the second part of the question and uh, what are the dangers of it? Sure. <clears throat> and also, <clears throat> what are uh, some that that included? So, yep. They can become our focus, what we live for instead of living for God. When we focus on the other things we as sheep, I kept referencing to the uh, mm -hmm. thing as sheep. So, we as sheep go astray and leave the shepherd's presence. God, the shepherd, will be with us forever. These things, these other things are temporary, where moth and rust destroy, as in Matthew 6 19. Uh, the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12 is a good example of why uh, we should not focus on these things. The guy who built the uh, barns, uh, how he thought he did good because he was focusing on his uh, physical uh, gains. Because like in the parable, we never know where our, when our life will end. So we take our eyes off the shepherd and we look at ourselves and see what we gain for ourselves instead of what we gain for God. The things that we gain for God and others are more important. Obeying the two most important commandments. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And love the Lord your God with all your heart. So, and then I thought a good example of focusing on health in the wrong way was King Asa. After he had God, asked God to help against the Ethiopians and God delivered uh, them from the Ethiopians. Then he relied on Syria instead of God to fight against Israel when the Israelites were fighting against them. God sent a prophet to warn him of the wrong he did by doing that. And instead of repenting, he was angry with the prophet and put him in prison because he was mad at what he told him. So then three years later, when he became sick in his feet, which was really severe, he did not seek God, but the physicians. Now, before the incident with Israel, he had peace for 30 plus years because of relying on God. Uh, and uh, dedicating time and things to God. So God caused the sickness to come because of him turning to Syria and being mad at the prophet. It is not implying that relying on doctors was bad, but that he did not seek God, as we as his sheep need to do. Job is an example of one who was not living in or practicing sin. His heart was right with God. Before God tested him, he was wealthy and healthy, then God tested Job's faith, not because of sins that he committed, 
God took everything away except for his life, and he had him get sick. This is not because of sin. Then through this, Job did not focus on God when his friends confronted him. He focused on himself defensively, which caused him to say that he was righteous. And then I listened, wrong page. There you go. Listened to a message uh, by MacArthur this week on uh, Daniel 3. I thought some of the things he listed on there were really good. So I listened to a sermon by him. And he listed a list of six idols that all begin with P, possessions, plenty, pride, people, pleasure, and projects, even if it includes saws, <laughs> all can take the place of God. We may think having these is a sign of a good relationship with God, but they become more of our focus instead. We may think that we need to focus on these, but living for God will bring these things more to an accomplishment. God can and should be what gets in the way of other things. God will allow some of these things to go wrong, but that is a testing of our faith and understanding of the truth. And a phrase he had in that message is that was good. Idolatry is worshiping the wrong God and the right God in the wrong way. Thank you. And I looked at John 16, 33, where God says, these things have I spoken to you, so in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I've overcome the world. And then again, going back to Paul, if anybody earned God's blessings, it could have been Paul, but he had to learn to be content in whatever circumstance that included beatings, hunger, persecution. He learned to be content in Christ. And one verse I'd like to read is uh, 2 Corinthians 12. It really dispels that idea of health, wealth, and prosperity. 12, verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, <clears throat> to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implore, implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. And notice that word content again shows up in that verse. I'm content. Weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions. So if our faith in God rests on circumstances, sooner or later, there's going to come a time when those well, circumstances aren't what we think they should be. And that will destroy our faith. We don't think God's answering the way that he should. And I might switch microphones because I think I'm cutting in and out. <laughs> yeah. So number three, how do we, we cultivate an abundant life? Joe, if you want to tackle that one. All right. I looked up the word cultivate because I thought it was an interesting uh, word to use. Uh, and it means to prepare and use a farming term or to acquire or develop. In this portion of scripture, the key thing that the sheep do is respond to the shepherd's voice uh, because they know his voice. So according to this, we as his sheep followers uh, need to get familiar with his voice. This is by being familiar with living a Christian life according to scripture, to know scripture, reading it, meditate on it, praying, practicing that which we hear from scripture and other Christians and God himself. Doing the four things in Acts 2, uh, 42 with others as sheep of the flock uh, respond with the flock being around other Christians and doing these things uh, regularly, helping to cultivate an abundant life on a personal training. It is to be intimate, a close relationship one-on-one -on -one with the shepherd, how a shepherd tends to his sheep out of love and care, so does our shepherd. We as a sheep are to do what we should do to be intimate with him, doing things selflessly from our heart for him. First Timothy 4, 6 to 10, I think I'm going to turn to that, says, First Timothy 6, 4 to 10. That was a good verse to turn to. He is puffed up with conceit, 
and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food or clothing, these things will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and to snare, and may into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is rid of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced himself with many pains. So it says how we need to be trained in the faith. Um, I read the wrong verses. <laughs> First Timothy 4, 6 to 10. I'm like, that is not what I remember looking at. Okay, so let me read it. Sorry, it took a little more time here. So 1 Timothy 4, 6 to 10. I'm like, I don't remember reading that about the uh, money. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So that is more what I meant to read. Sorry for the side verses. Okay, so in First Timothy, in those verses, it says how we need to be trained in faith of good doctrine, just like physical training is good for the body. Uh, some for some while yet godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come there are many scriptures especially in the epistles that tell us how to be prepared and ready for living an abundant life because with doing things regularly we are ready to avoid thieves and strangers which are uh, mentioned in the verses that we're focusing on uh, which are false doctrines, teachings, things that can be influenced by in the world. The more we meditate and train ourselves, the more we'll be ready because we'll be familiar with his voice when he calls for us, which leads us to an abundant life. We also need to learn what we need to avoid and not get wrapped up in it. And that First Timothy 4, 7 says, I have nothing to do with irreverent and silly myths. Second Timothy 4, 2 through 5 is on preaching the word, be watchful. Uh, and will help others for themselves and turn their ears away from the truth and be turned false uh, teachers will do you know, side to fables being aware of false teachers as a preacher be ready for tough times afflictions but fulfill your ministry this can apply to us on a regular basis because we are to be ready to share the word with others even if we are not preachers as a parent i know the more a child hears you regularly telling them to do what is right which the shepherd does to us the more they will remember but they also need to listen to his voice when a child doesn't listen to their parents they reap a consequence and usually get punished or have an outcome that is worse than if they listen which is earned by cultivation so, sorry that was kind of lengthy <laughs> got sidelined good don't worry i will i will shorten it okay but even your even your side verses, I noticed the word content was showed up there three yeah. three different times. So actually, did continue that yeah, theme of content. <laughs> so it worked. <laughs> got it in <laughs> for Okay, thank you. Uh, I have underlined and listened to the shepherd's voice. That's <laughs> that's how we cultivate in one life, and I. This is where I apparently have wrote down Ephesians 1, 3 through all this whole bunch of just talking about, you know, every spiritual blessing. And I guess when I'm thinking of cultivating, I, I, my thought always goes back to his word and just reminded who God is, what he has done for us. And, and what he continues to do for us, our inheritance that we will have in heaven because of what he has done. That, I don't know, that just kind of makes, you know, it's all about God. He's done it all. He created us. I, 
that's where the focus is and it's it's not about me it's it's about him i mean he could snap his finger and take me from this earth today right now and uh but he's god uh that's kind of that's what his word always draws me to is uh, who he is and and so I'm just going to read Ephesians, that part just, I mean, it kind of mimics what we read in John, really. Um, blessed be the God and Father, over the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, uh, that we will be holy and blameless before him. Just that that thought that he chose us. We are his sheep. He knows us by name. Uh, he not only is the sh he the shepherd, he's the door, he's the way through. Uh, and then that made me think of I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It was John 14, 6. Just, it's a bunch of thoughts on paper, so... That's kind of how brain spewed out this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And we keep coming back to that, hearing his voice. And I also went back to it a little bit later in John chapter 10, where it says, verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. So as Nate said, it's all of God. They never perish, nor will snatch them all my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the Father are one. So to know his voice, to listen to his voice, um, we want to go back in time, about 47 years here, and Jerry sitting in, in a church on a Sunday morning during the winter months of 1976, not listening to what was going on in church, <laughs> rehearsing the times I would need to run each lap of a two mile to get the kind of times I wanted that spring. Um, 75 seconds at a quarter, 2.30 at a half, 3.45 at three after three laps, five minutes after four, 6.15 after five, 7.30 after three. And just, okay, <clears throat> I, I was missing the point in church, but that's, that's another story. <clears throat> the point is in track, each lap that you run, the, 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 the guy is reading off the time that you've run. And <clears throat> as you finish each new lap, there's a cumulative time that's given. The tricky part of that is that bigger trap meets a lot of runners and a lot of people cheering and hollering and yelling. There's all kinds of noise. <clears throat> and not only that, but you're straining to the edge of what you can do. You're breathing hard. It's hard to hear. <clears throat> but it, it, it's an, I would listen very intently and you draw the spiritual analogy that follows here. Um, so imagine the scene, the noise, all that's going on. And, uh, but listening intently for that one voice in the midst of all that noise, all that chaos, in the midst of all that exertion, that one voice that I knew had the truth in a sense of what my time was at that point, and I really wanted to keep very close track of, because you want to pace yourself very carefully <clears throat> and not go too fast or too slow. Um, so, Likewise, life is full of busyness and hectic things and all kinds of competing noises. And at times we're strained to the edge of our endurance. That's life. <clears throat> but to know that voice, to, to recognize that voice, to shut all, out all the distractions, to hear that voice through scripture, through friends, through Bible memory, through circumstances, to hear that voice. <clears throat> That's not an easy thing to do, and especially in today's microwave society where we expect information three seconds before we ask for it. Um, Philip Keller in his book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, comment, commented that the life of quiet overcoming, of happy repose, of rest in his presence, of confidence in his management, is something that few Christians ever enjoy. And if you think about it, Philip Keller just described contentment. Um, Lots of voices that we can listen to that aren't his voice, that rob, that steal, 
Um, pride, as was mentioned, Joel mentioned quite a few. But also, in a backward sense, not appreciating the abundant life. And I've quoted this book many times with Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, cautions us to be careful to listen to the right voice. <clears throat> he commented, as long as you fix your attention on your sin, you will fail to see how you can be safe. But as long as you look at the high priest, Jesus, you will fail to see how you can be in danger. Looking inside of ourselves or listening to our own logic, our own, our own voice, we can only anticipate harshness from heaven. Looking out to Christ, we can anticipate only gentleness. So we cultivate abundant life by listening to his voice. And perhaps just think of that scene I described in track and imagine it for a second, but picking out the one voice that you need to hear. So number four, what role do trials and pain and suffering have related to the abundant life? Nate, do you want to take a crack at it? Sure. I just wrote it. Points us back to the one who sustains us. I uh, went to Romans 8, 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for the sake, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, we, all those trials aren't going to be able to separate us from the one, the, from the shepherd. Uh, and it brings us back to him. And if he's the one that, that sustains us, he's the one that let us, he's our shepherd. And we'll, once you turn to him in those, in those times of, of need or if, if life isn't going the way you, you thought or you think it should be going and turn follow the shepherd again uh, draw back to him thank you so uh, i have <clears throat> uh, being that god is present in our life causes it to be more abundant he allows trials and pain to happen to have us turn to him more and see him more clearly why we need him uh, take job as an example uh, god allowed job to go through the losses and sicknesses to better him it may have seemed like god was distancing himself and being unfair to job but god knew that job was a righteous man but he also knew that job was righteous in his own eyes and the only way that job would see it was through his losses and confrontations with his friends uh, James 1, 2 through 4 reminds us what we get from going through trials, things that are needed for an abundant life, uh, tested faith, steadfastness. We may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That is why God allows those things to happen. Also, because of the trials and pain we go through, we learn what we did wrong that caused those problems, or as Job, or as with Job, how we may have reacted to the situation that was not right and God wanted to teach us. So looking back at our trials and pain, we see what we learned and apply it to future situations. Also, when we help others out who go through the same type of situation, by that, then we have more of an abundant life because we are not focusing on ourselves and the things we are going through, focusing on the shepherd. Because of going through these things before and hopefully having learned what God is where God is or what God is teaching us we have a tendency to not listen to him and remember what he told us for future situations but that is why we need to pray and remind ourselves what we've learned second Corinthians uh, 12 9 regarding Paul oh, I'm gonna read that and read the right one this time second Corinthians 12 9 <clears throat> But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Uh, regarding that, Paul asking God to remove the thorn in his flesh. We see our need for him. Uh, that verse is regarding uh, Paul asking God to remove the thorn in his flesh. We see our need for him through these things, like a sheep needing a shepherd as it gets caught in brush, trapped, wanders, stolen. In these situations, the sheep can't do anything. It is helpless. We too, like sheep, see his power through our trials or weaknesses. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, trials have a purifying effect, right? Um, Romans, First Peter talked about trials developing character, promoting growth, even though we resist at the time, even though it hurts at the time, that pain is real. But um, the high priest can sympathize with every weakness, every trial that we, that we have. Probably many of you have heard C.S. Lewis's famous quote that pain is God's megaphone, um, trials, the way of getting our attention. And that purifying effect that Peter talked about, that the testing of your faith is more precious than gold. And as a result, it's tested by fire, but maybe found in, to praise and glory and honor, revelation of Jesus Christ. It's that purifying process. James Dobson wrote a book many years ago. I, I really appreciated reading when God doesn't make sense and that um, he touched on this type of thing when, when we don't understand the circumstances that we're in and God's not making sense. Um, James Dobson commented that God wants us to reach a point where our trust in him is independent of our understanding of the circumstances. And I thought that's, that's good. <clears throat> um, we want to understand the circumstances. We want to be able to put it all together, but we can't because we don't see the whole picture. I've mentioned the book before, but um, Treasure in an Oatmeal Box, a kid's book, just does a great job of talking about trials and difficulties and pain and how each ingredient, like each ingredient of oatmeal cookies by themselves is yucky, lard, butter, yucky by itself, but put them together, you have something that people enjoy. Likewise, trials at the time are difficult, painful, but in the end, they have a purifying process. So number five, and I think Joe, how does an abundant life enable us to be a witness to others in the church and outside the church? All right. Um, those in the church will see how content we are with our lives, even in tough situations that they know that we're going through. They will see how spiritually mature we are when we handle things the way we do. They'll also ask for advice when they go through their own problems. The main thing that they'll see is how often we turn to and listen to the Good Shepherd in every situation, good or bad. How often we turn to God and give him the glory, praise, and credit for what we do and how we are. Uh, I personally struggle with bringing up God even in my conversations with Christians because of how much my sin is on my mind all the time. And I am afraid of saying things in certain ways to offend people or make an argument. This is an example of not focusing on God. It is focusing on myself and not on the shepherd. We have to be the same around those outside the church because we cannot be different to those saved or unsaved. We are to be who we are by being that way we will be lights to those around us. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Um, I'm going to turn that. It says, you are the lights of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house in the same way let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven the key answer to this question that applies to both areas is the word living if we truly lived an abundant life all the time um, it would be shown all the time because that is all that we focus on christ that is so that it is all that we can see as Christ the shepherd. So then he will be in our line of focus right in front of our eyes spiritually that everything else will fade. This will help us remember how to be in every situation. So we need to continually be fed uh, by the shepherd, but we also need to be, keep eating the food 
that he feeds. As a parent, I see how picky kids are with eating. As they get older and mature, they like more and more food and are less picky. We too, as children of God, need, need to mature and eat the spiritual food that he gives. The pickier we are, the more hungry we'll be and the less we'll learn how healthy needed that food is, even if it doesn't taste good. Uh, the healthy gross food is trials and pain that we learn to bear and go through, and this too will help us be a witness to others of an abundant life. A good example of abundant life and how it should be effective uh, to others is the parable of the four soils um, in Matthew 13. If we are the first three soils, we let the word, food, and what God gives us be snatched, have no root or be choked, because we are focusing on ourselves, the world, and the devil. But if we focus on God, we will be the seeds sown on the good soil. We will bear fruit and produce some 100-fold, some 60, and some 30. So that too shows us how an abundant life is to be good soil, that it will produce more fruit, which is those are which those around us will be affected by. Our abundant life and more fruit will come from it. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Nate, do you want to address that question? Um, how does living an abundant life enable us to witness to others in the church and outside the church? I wrote a song down on there. <laughs> Satisfied in thee, Lord Jesus, I am blessed. Uh, if you are living a life that reflects Jesus, shouldn't that affect everyone we meet? That was, that was really all I wrote down for that. I mean, if we're, if we're living a life that is focused on Christ, and uh, I mean, that should cause a change in us, and people should be able to see that, and we should be different. <clears throat> yeah, we should reflect his glory. I thought of a couple of verses in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you've obeyed, not only in my presence, but not much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, so the abundant life, both to desire and to work for his good pleasure. And then a very practical way that Ron will relate to, right? <clears throat> Do all things without complaining or arguing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights to the world. So this is a very practical witness. If, as Nate said, if we're reflecting Christ, the world will see that. So in closing, I'm going to go back to uh, Philip Keller's comment about one of the calamities of Christianity is a tendency to talk in ambiguous generalities. Someday, somehow, some way. <clears throat> and in his book, he really encourages us to look at words and pick apart that word and go into depth with that word. So again, think about the word abundant, kind of pick it apart. Think about listening to his voice. And at least from my life experience, that scene in the trap mate really illustrates picking out that one voice when you're exhausted and there's a hundred other voices picking out that one voice <clears throat> and then thinking about that word contentment, trusting in the Lord when we don't understand our circumstances, because often we don't, <clears throat> having that confidence in the Lord and trusting in his circumstances. So Nate, would you like, or Joe, you want to close in prayer? Uh, dear uh, Lord, thank you for this time that we can uh, go over this uh, discussion about how to live an abundant life. I pray that we will uh, continue uh, to focus on you and turn to you and uh, just seek that abundant life uh, through you and you alone who can give it to us. Thank you uh, for uh, this time that we had. We just give this time to you in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Remember safety first with saws. We want you to see you with all your digits. So wear a hoodie, long hair, and long shirts.